The little-known Latin expression non gratum annus redentum translates as not worth a rat's ass. This ironic phrase became the slogan of the Tunnel Rats, American, Australian and New Zealander soldiers who performed underground search and destroy missions during the Vietnam War in the infamous Viet Cong underground tunnels. Unpleasant surprises awaited the soldiers in the dungeon, from which they did not always return safe and sound. In the new episode of How It Was, we will tell you why the Vietnamese dug hundreds of kilometers of tunnels underground, how to kill the enemy with feces, and why the tunnel rats preferred a knife to a firearm. The Vietnamese began to dig the first underground tunnels back in the mid-1940s during the First Indochina War of Independence against French colonists. With the arrival of the US Army in the 1960s, the underground tunnel network quickly expanded by hundreds of miles. Digging them became the main occupation for thousands of selfless Vietnamese volunteers who wielded hoes and baskets. These paths had to be dug into the hard laterite clay soil. It was impossible to dig into this kind of soil in dry weather. It hardens like stone. But when the rainy season begins, it softens and becomes easy to work with. When the rains ended and the clay dried out again, the walls of the tunnels became as strong as concrete. The tunnels weren't constructed in straight lines, but with corners that had between a 60 degree and 120 degree turn. Due to this, it was difficult and inconvenient to fire small arms weapons in the tunnels, and loud sounds of shooting in narrow passages often injured the eardrums. Moreover, the clay walls reflected the blast wave from the exploded grenades. Each tunnel had several drainage wells, 30 meters in depth. Thanks to them, the underground passages were not flooded during the rainy seasons. The entrance to such tunnels was narrow, about 60 by 90 centimeters. All underground tunnels of Vietnam were divided into simple and complex. The simple ones were small holes dug in the ground from 5 to 100 meters in length. There was nothing superfluous in such tunnels, only a place for an ambush, a cover, and a secret passage for a hasty evacuation. The entrances and exits of such tunnels, the so-called spider holes, were carefully camouflaged. Complex tunnels are a different case. The Viet Cong soldiers dug them at several levels, placing them one above the other and connecting them with narrow manholes. The tunnels went 20 to 25 meters deep, creating whole subterranean cities. They housed hospitals, training areas, arms depots, barracks, kitchens, and printing houses located on different floors. The partisans kept a lot of captured weapons in the armory. According to legend, once they even managed to hide in their dungeon an American battle tank. Homemade anti-personnel mines were created in primitive forges. There was enough drinking water and food to lead a relatively safe existence for months. Ventilation systems allowed soldiers to stay underground for sustained periods of time, but it was still very stuffy in there. Doctors in the underground operated on wounded soldiers with primitive surgical instruments, almost always without anesthesia. For brain surgery, doctors used drills, amputations were performed with hacksaws, and instruments were sterilized in pans of boiling water. Handheld generators provided dim lighting in the wards. In some tunnels, there were even amateur theatres where performances on political themes were staged. Some sort of school classes were organised for the partisans' children. There, in the underground, the Viet Cong buried their fallen comrades. For the deceased, recesses were made in the walls. They were placed in there in the embryo position and covered with a thin layer of clay. The tunnels were located so that when the Americans attacked, it was possible to hide there quickly and, at the same time, be able to conduct an attack from there. Sometimes it happened that the Vietnamese could no longer stay in the tunnels. In such cases, they withdrew through secret exits, leaving ammunition and food in the dungeon. 
When the Americans left the area, the Viet Cong returned to their tunnels. An example of a massive tunnel complex is in the Ku Chi district, 20 miles north of Saigon. During the war, this area was actively bombed and sometimes there was no stone left unturned on the surface. But underground, the tunnel, which housed thousands of soldiers of the Viet Cong army, continued to save its life. Some tunnels in Ku Chi and other parts of Vietnam stretched for hundreds of miles, reaching the Cambodian border. Along with their Australian and New Zealand allies, the Americans faced tunnel attacks in the very early days of the Vietnam War. They understood that it would not be possible to win without solving this problem. At first, they tried to destroy the underground cities by bombing them from the outside. But this did not bring success due to their complex and intricate system and dense clay. The maximum that was possible was to destroy only some part of the tunnels, but the Vietnamese quickly built a bypass. After that, the Americans tried to throw grenades and gas cylinders into the tunnels, but this did not bring serious harm to the Vietnamese. The Americans began to send dogs into the underground caves, but the animals were blown up by mines. Dog handlers refused to send them to certain death. It became clear that people would have to go there instead, and this is how a new unit called the Tunnel Rats appeared in the American Army. The first such detachment was formed based on the 25th Infantry Division, and then such units appeared in all American divisions. The unit recruited only volunteers, athletic, thin fighters, no taller than 165 centimeters and not suffering from claustrophobia. Those who met the requirements were soldiers of predominantly European, Puerto Rican or Mexican origin. Before leaving for the first time into the dungeon, the Tunnel Rats spent three months learning mine detection, booby trap disarming and planting explosives. Usually, they worked in pairs. One went underground and transmitted information by radio about the tunnel to a partner outside, whose task was to draw an approximate plan of the underground city. Sometimes the tunnel rats entered the dungeon in a group. They walked at a distance of several meters from each other so that the explosion of a booby trap would not kill everyone. The tunnel rats chose suitable places and laid mines to destroy the underground passage if that was the task. Sometimes the soldiers did not destroy the dungeon, but took prisoner one of its inhabitants or took important documents. This was one of the most challenging tasks, given that the soldiers were opposed by hundreds of partisans for whom these tunnel labyrinths had already become a second home. In addition to general physical fitness, there were many more requirements for the tunnel rats. They had to make every move, every step with the utmost care. They hid in the dark so that the Vietnamese wouldn't suspect that uninvited guests had come into the dungeon. But the most important thing that was required for this task was comprehensive psychological preparation. The Tunnel Rat mission was considered extremely dangerous. The underground soldiers were ready to face the Viet Cong, but this was not the only danger in the dungeon. Around every corner or turn of the tunnel, this or that trouble lay in wait for the fighters. Just to think about the homemade mines makes one shudder. At regular intervals throughout many of the systems, guerrillas dug the tunnel so it took a deep downward U-shaped bend and then filled these depressions with water to flood some sections of the underground passage and detain enemy soldiers. In other parts of the dungeon, the Viet Cong sprayed poisonous gas that killed the enemies or knocked them out of consciousness. But the worst thing that happened to the intruders were the legendary Viet Cong booby traps. One of those traps were punji sticks, mostly made out of bamboo with a sharpened spike on one end to impale its victim. Sometimes the sticks were smeared with urine, feces or plant poison to also cause infection. The sticks were often jammed into camouflaged pits dug in areas likely to be passed through by American troops. The Viet Cong fighters also set traps with boxes of scorpions and poisonous snakes in the tunnels. The invaders suffered as well from other inhabitants of the underground labyrinths. 
centipedes, fire ants, hornets, spiders, and bats. Sometimes the tunnel rats encountered real rats who were carriers of the bubonic plague. Even the tunnels themselves posed a danger to the soldiers. The walls of the underground passages were usually made of solid clay, but sometimes the Vietnamese built unreliable structures that collapsed. And this is not to mention the fact that one could simply get lost in the tunnel. The American aircraft were watering the Vietnamese forests abundantly with the infamous Agent Orange. The remains of this substance leached from topsoil into the tunnel environment. The consequences for those US soldiers who had no gas masks were fatal. The chemicals caused severe poisoning. The firearms given to the American soldiers in the underground tunnel were almost useless and they rarely used them, limiting themselves to M1911 pistols and bayonet knives. The knives were needed not only for reprisals against enemies, the soldiers also used the bayonets to search for traps. Some fighters attached homemade silencers to their pistols to not go deaf during the shooting or used civilian revolvers sent from home. The tunnel rats were forbidden to shoot more than five or six times in a row when meeting an enemy so that the Viet Cong guerrillas would not suspect that the soldier was running out of ammunition. The tunnel rats usually went on a mission with a gas mask and flashlight. A gas mask had to be worn outside because it was challenging to do this in a narrow tunnel. During clashes with the Viet Cong, they often had to use hand-to-hand -hand combat skills. At first, information about the tunnel rats did not spread beyond the Viet Cong. The new unit became famous at home in January 1966 after the joint US-Australian military operation Crimp was carried out in the Binh Duong province. The area was densely dotted with underground tunnels and the tunnel rats were indispensable. Crimp was their first major special operation, after which they began to be attracted to such operations more often. The tunnel rats unit was small with at most 120 men in the country at any time, and a total of around 700 who served from 1965 to 1972. During that period, 36 soldiers were killed in the dungeon and about 200 were wounded. Experts say that most of the tunnel rats suffered from PTSD until the end of their days. Other countries also resorted to using their tunnel rats. In particular, Afghanistan had its own ancient underground tunnels. They were used to transport water in peacetime, but during the 1979-1989 Soviet war in Afghanistan, such tunnels were used by the Mujahideen fighters. The Soviet 40th Army fielded their own tunnel clearance and demolition units, which were given the task of clearing the tunnels of enemy combatants, disarming booby traps, and destroying the underground complexes. For a long time, the world did not know the true scale of Vietnam's subterranean labyrinth. In 1978, BBC journalists got permission to visit Vietnam, becoming the first Western correspondents to come there since a unified communist government was established in the country in 1975. The Vietnamese tunnels continue to exist in our days. Thousands of tourists from all over the world come to this Asian country to climb through the underground passages, and this brings a good income to the budget of Vietnam. The authorities tried to preserve the underground tunnels in their original form, but with one important difference. Now, there are no cleverly hidden mines and no insidious deadly traps. Do you like the video? Please click the bell so you don't miss new episodes of How It Was.